Hi, so I'm Dimitri, and today we're going to talk about how you can control the motors in your robot to do the things you want. Uh, so imagine you have an arm, just a simple one link arm, and that arm has to go from horizontal to 90 degrees. How do you do that? How do you provide the motor with the right kinds of commands that lets it move the arm there and keep it there, even despite disturbances? The simplest way to do this is called open loop control. And in open loop control, you basically have a desired output that you're giving to the system, like 90 degrees for your arm. And the controller takes that desired output, sends some commands to the motor, and then the motor drives the arm to that position. But the problem with this kind of control, even though it's really simple, is that it can't deal with things that you don't expect. So if there's an unexpected disturbance from, let's say, driving your robot or somebody bumping your robot, this kind of control won't help you. A better kind of control is called feedback control or closed loop control. And the reason it's called closed loop control is that there's a feedback loop which is measuring the actual output of the system. In our case, that's the angle of the arm and reporting that to the controller. So let's see how that works. The actual output is measured by the sensor. The measured output is then subtracted from the desired output. And the error, that's the difference between measured and desired, is sent to the controller. The controller then computes what to send to the motor, and the motor drives the system. And by having this closed loop, you can actually get rid of those errors in your system. So there are many ways to do control, and how do we quantify which way is good. Well, there's a bunch of things that people look at in control to determine if a controller is good or not. The first is called rise time. And rise time is basically the time it takes while the output rises from 10% of your desired to 90%. Percent overshoot is how much you're going past your desired output. So in the case of a robot arm, you might see it go past 90 degrees and then come back to 90. And if that happens, then you know you have some overshoot. You've overshot your target. Then there's something called steady state error. What this basically means is that the system isn't getting exactly where it's supposed to be. So you want to get to 90 degrees, but it only gets to 85 degrees, right? And it, and it kind of sticks there. And settling time is basically how long it takes your system to reach your steady state. And steady state is just, you know, what's it's settled down to. Now, the kind of control that we're going to talk about here is called PID control. It stands for Proportional Integral Derivative. And the reason that it's one of the most popular types of control is that it meets three key requirements. First, the response is immediate. So as soon as you tell it, go here, it'll start moving, right? That's very good. Second, the steady state error is zero, meaning that if you give it enough time, it'll eventually reach zero steady state error. And third, that it can respond to transient errors, meaning if someone bumps it or another robot runs into your robot and the arm gets jostled, then it's going to be able to respond to all of those transient errors. So let's take a look inside this box, the controller box, and see what PID really is. PID is basically an equation. And the input into this equation is the current error, which we call ET. And what we do with that error is three things. First, we have the proportional part of the control, KP times ET. KP is just a constant. It's just some number you pick. And ET is, of course, the current error. Then you add to that the integral part of the control. And here, what you're doing is you're summing up all of the errors you've seen up until now and you're multiplying them by a constant, ki. Then you have the derivative part of the control. And in the derivative part of the control, you're looking at the latest change in error, which is et minus et minus 1. That means the current error minus the error that you saw at the previous time step. And again, you're multiplying that by a constant, which is kd. And that's it. You just implement these three parts in your controller, and you produce the controller's output, which drives the motor. So what do these three parts of the PID actually do? Let's look at some diagrams of what happens when you set a reference input 
and then watch how the controller responds. So let's think about a one-link arm. You set the reference or the desired output at 90 degrees and then watch how all these different components of PID respond. So let's say we start with just P only. So we forget about the integral and the derivative. We just take them out of the equation. And we look only what happens when we have KP times ET. Well, we might see something like this. The arm will go quickly towards 90 degrees, but actually won't reach it. And it might end up having a large steady state error, which means that, you know, it'll end up at, let's say, 80 degrees instead of 90. If we include integral control in there, so we now have the P and the I terms, we're going to see something different. So if we use integral control alone, then we're going to see that it doesn't respond well at all. It's very slow to respond. But if we combine I and P and get PI, then we're going to see uh, a much better response. So that's what you see here. The arm goes up to 90. It actually goes a little bit past 90. And then it settles back down to 90. And uh, the steady state error is going to be very, very close to zero. What happens with that D part, though, the derivative part of the control? Well, the D part you can't really use by itself. Uh, it won't really help you very much. But when you combine the derivative with the proportional part, then you'll see that you can get fast rise time, so it'll respond really fast, but it might still have that steady state error. Then, when you put all these three together, you get PID. And PID control is really the best of all of these. So it has a fast rise time. It doesn't overshoot, right? It won't go past 90 degrees. It'll go very quickly towards 90 and settle down at 90. And it uh, won't have any steady state error. So uh, if you give it enough time, it will exactly reach 90. Now, the only question we have left to answer is how we set those gains, KP, KI, and KD. And that's tough. So the right way to do it is to get a mathematical model of your system and then use what's called control theory to tune those gains. But unfortunately, that's a little bit more advanced than we're getting into today. So today, what we're going to do is think about how to do this when you don't have a good mathematical model of your system. And you have to use what are called rules of thumb and experimentation to tune your gains. So what are these rules of thumb? Well, when you're doing this, you got to be a little bit careful that you don't make the system unstable. Because if you go around setting gains that are arbitrarily high, your system might respond very quickly, but it might also get into a very dangerous thing called instability. And a system is unstable when the output basically can exceed any bound that you put on it. So what does that look like for our one link arm? The robot might respond very quickly and move very quickly towards that 90 degree set point, but it will start to oscillate. And the oscillation of that one link arm will increase until something breaks. So you really don't want that to happen to your robot. So you have to be very careful and watch out for instability, especially when you have what's called sensor lag. And that means that you're not sensing the output as quickly as you'd like. Uh, it, the sensor signal is very slow. So by the time you get here, you're um, only sensing what happened here. And then you're responding incorrectly to what happened. So uh, lag can definitely uh, cause instability. So be careful when you're tuning your gains and watch out for instability. So now we're going to look at the ziegler nichols method for tuning PID gains. Now I want to say a couple of things about this before we begin. The first is that this is a kind of rule of thumb. It's not going to work for every system and the gains that you get out of it may not be gains that you like. It might require further adjustment. But it is one of the standard methods to tune your PID gains and is effective for many systems. So the way that this method works is you set KI and KD to zero. So you take the integral and derivative parts out of the controller and you just have that proportional part. Then you increase KP, the proportional constant, up from zero until the system starts showing a steady oscillation. That means it's going back and forth between two states. So if you have an arm, it might start oscillating like this. 
around the set point. But be very careful here. You don't want this oscillation to be growing, right? Because then we're going to get to instability. You want it to be a steady oscillation that doesn't grow over time. So once you get to that point, you write down the KP that you had. And that we're going to call KC the critical gain. The other thing that you write down is the period of the oscillation. And so you look at the oscillating output and you measure how long it takes uh, for it to complete one cycle. That's the period. Once you've got those things, KC, the critical gain, and uh, PC, the oscillation period, you can plug them into uh, these equations here, which tell you exactly what your KP, KI, and KD should be. But as I said, this method is not going to work all the time, and it may give you a controller that's a little bit too aggressive and might cause some overshoot. So you might want to then apply some more rules of thumb to tune the gains even further. But here we're talking about small adjustments to the gains. We're not talking about really big ones. So you can look at this table to see the effects that different gains will have on the system. And there's always a trade-off. So for instance, if you increase KP, the rise time goes down, but the overshoot goes up. And again, I just want to emphasize that these are rules of thumb, and so different systems will react differently with uh, these tunings. And uh, one thing you especially want to be careful of is KD. So KD, according to this rule of thumb, will improve stability. But unfortunately, that's only true when KD is small. If you make KD very, very large, the system can easily go unstable. So now that you know how to uh, use PID control and tune your gains, you can make your robot do all sorts of amazing things.